Um, I'd like to take the opportunity as we're getting settled here to welcome you to the Florida Solar Energy Center. Um, it's nice to see this room filled, okay, to take advantage of uh, that, those opportunities. Um, as, as we're getting settled here, um, I want to remind a few things on the housekeeping issues. Um, we are on a webinar, right, and so uh, we will try to repeat your question back to us uh, so that gets recorded on there as well as we answer them. And what I've asked our speakers to do here is that we'll try to go through about eight minutes on each speaker and then leave all the questions at the end. Okay, so we have an opportunity to get through all the presentations. And then we have a break scheduled afterwards. But before we get started, I want to talk about the fact that we're looking here today at international opportunities. And I want to just talk to you about some numbers. Um, how many people here know what the state of Florida's budget is? Uh, maybe you should know. It's on the order of about $60 billion. Do you know how much we spend on energy? in Florida. About sixty billion dollars. It's interesting that the state budget is staying level but we're spending more and more on energy. Now most of that energy comes in the form of fossil fuels. Right? Half of it which is used for our transportation and half of which is used for the generation of electricity. Do you know how much of that fossil fuels come from the state of Florida? Zero. Boy, if that isn't a market opportunity, I've never heard of one. Sixty billion dollars of market opportunity to replace imported stuff. Okay. Now we happen to also be on a peninsula located with a great port, okay, that enables us to ship things down to South America and various other places that also have energy issues associated with them. So when it comes to an opportunity, we have the market in our own state and we have the opportunity to get those things out there. We have to focus on this a little bit more. We heard about energy geeks. Okay, I think we can be money geeks and recognize that there's a big opportunity. So with that then, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our, uh, we're in the, yeah. oh, we have no order, which, order. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay, so our first presentation will be given by uh, Frank uh, Bivik, who's at Siemens Energy. Thank you, Jim. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jim, for the introduction, and thank uh, Mike and Space Coast um, Energy Consortium for the opportunity to talk here today. Uh, Siemens Energy has been uh, a uh, member of the uh, Florida community for uh, approaching 30 years now, and our campus, uh, located across the street from UCF's main campus uh, in Orlando, has grown uh, significantly since uh, 1983 when Westinghouse decided that Central Florida was a good place to make home and moved about 250 or so people down from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Since then our population has grown to over 3,000. We started out with one building, we now have four. Uh, we, as Westinghouse Power Generation, were acquired by Siemens in 1998. So Siemens has been a member of the community here since uh, since then for almost 14 years now. Uh, and the um, company is a in the United States is a uh, 20 billion dollar, 60,000 employee company. Globally, we're over $100 billion in sales annually, over 480,000 employees. Uh, we don't do Super Bowl ads as uh, much as GE does, but we compete with them in just about every other realm of business. Uh, the energy sector, which is headquartered in Orlando for all of the Americas, is uh, basically concerned with almost anything that uh, creates electricity. So all the way from the oil and gas segment to undersea power grids and deep well kinds of pumps and, and things that help with 3D seismic assessments of oil and gas resources, as well as offshore, as well as onshore, as well as fossil power generation. The world's most efficient gas turbines will be installed here on the Florida coast within and operational within a few years. Uh, wind power, uh, offshore wind is one of is, uh, Siemens is the world's largest supplier and, and market leader in offshore wind turbines. Uh, we have a solar, uh, hydro, 
uh, energy storage divisions, energy service, and transmission, delivery of electricity in, into those segments. So when it comes to energy, basically here in Central Florida, we're interested in just about every aspect of the energy, uh, in particular the electricity spectrum. Uh, as the first speaker, I have uh, sort of the opportunity to set the stage for international business opportunities. So the frame that Cheryl talked about, uh, I'll be painting with watercolors. That is some broad brush stroke kinds of things as to the nature of the opportunities. And then I'll allow the other panelists to sort of fill in in the oils and pencil and ink and get a little bit more specific as to, to what those things are. Whoops. Okay. Uh, Siemens believes uh, that there are four megatrends that uh, will determine the future of the world's uh, consumption and, and need for energy. And those trends are based on, not on day-to-day -day or year-to-year -year kinds of economics, but just on the nature of, of people. And that is, first of all, on, relative to the trend globally toward urbanization. That is, people have a tendency to cluster together, and hence they have needs for large amounts of power. And hence, uh, for three years now, basically, more people live in cities than live anywhere else. The other, the second trend is basically demographics. That is, every two seconds. Since I've started speaking, uh, roughly 13 or 14 people have been born and added to the planet's population. Third trend is globalization. That is, um, Friedman's book about the, uh, the uh, competition is a global kind of thing today, not, not a state, regional, or national kind of competition. And the amount of global trade is increasing uh, significantly, hence the need is to compete on a global basis. And lastly, there's a global concern, whether it's for climate change or just a cleaner environment in general, for uh, improved, uh, a, a cleaner planet. And I keep doing that. I have three points to make. The first point is about, that Mike alluded to a little bit earlier, is the size of the opportunity and the uh, demand for energy on a global basis. Uh, Mike was correct in stating that it will almost double, the demand for electricity in particular will almost double in the next eight years from uh, 500 and, or, yeah, from uh, a little over 5,300 5, gigawatts to almost uh, 9,700 gigawatts. That means that the total electric power generation infrastructure that's taken the world 100 years to create needs to be doubled within the next decade, next two decades, actually, up to, to 19... Uh, through 2030. Uh, that's a significant opportunity and the mix that, that you see on the slide there is a changing mix. That is, there's a significant increase in the amount of renewables, a significant increase in the amount of natural gas, a decrease in the amount of steam or coal-fired kinds of power plants, and a uh, steady state for nuclear and hydro. So not only is there an increase, but there's a change in the technologies that are favored and the, the need for increasing efficiency in all of those technologies. Okay, sure. Uh, the second point I want to make talks a little bit about diversity, and that is that these uh, requirements or just the, uh, let's say, distribution of energy wealth, if you will, varies considerably as you go around the globe. What this slide shows basically is the energy imbalances that exist on a continental kind of basis. And we talk about energy independence in the United States fairly frequently for like every administration for a long time now. And the three bars are 1990, 2010, and 2030. You see a significant dependency on oil uh, in the past uh, well, oh, and then the first two bars, and not so much in the second bar. If you look, however, at Europe and even China, their energy imbalances are so significantly different than, than North America that 
China needs very much to be a world leading exporter to generate enough money to pay for its energy bills. That's a, a problem that they have. In the United States, there are sufficient natural gas and sufficient oil resources now being, un, now being tapped uh, with new technologies, at least on an America's basis, including Canada and Mexico as sources. We have a chance within the next 20 years to, become, to truly become on a, a, on a um, continental basis energy independent of the rest of the world. Those diversity of challenges exist on a national basis either, and the directions that each of those countries have taken have, has been, are significantly different. In Denmark, environment is all, and basically they're striving for 100% renewable power by 2050. India has a significant uh, hundreds of millions, almost a billion people without electricity. Their, their issue is power for all. And they're satisfying that issue by turning to coal-fired power plants. In the US, affordability is still a key, particularly in recent years because of the economy. China has a massive nuclear power expansion going on, as well as coal and fossil fuel, as well as renewable, as well as just about everything that they can do and find. And Sweden is blessed with a lot of mountains and, and hydro resources, and they're basically just expanding what they have. The third point that I have is basically those different challenges require different solutions. And those solutions are, are, are a very broad swath of, of different types of technologies. Uh, Siemens supplies all of those different, different things from offshore wind to uh, grid access from offshore power systems to uh, supporting the oil and gas industry and those advanced frame gas turbines that I mentioned earlier. And lastly, uh, the way that Central Florida and Space Coast Florida can access those markets are pretty much what Cheryl said earlier. That is, uh, that you need to focus on innovation to get differentiation in, in what you're selling. Uh, being a cost leader is not as uh, viable an approach as being an innovative smart leader. You need to understand your customers, you need to understand what problems you're solving for your customers, and you need to understand what benefits they're deriving from it, and then basically use what you got, that is leverage your existing resources, and here on the Space Coast, that's the technology talent, it's facilities, it's relationships and partnerships that exist uh, all over the place. And with that, Jim, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Um, as I said uh, before, we'll hold our questions until uh, after the end, and we'll get a chance to ask all the panelists. All right, our uh, next presenter is uh, Mark Senti, who's president of Advanced Magnet Lab. Happens to also be the co-chairman of the Space Coast Energy Consortium. Thank you, Jim. And on behalf of the uh, consortium and, and the Advanced Magnet Lab, uh, welcome. We appreciate your attendance here today. So this is a good transition. We had a great talk by Dr. Martin and following up with a large company, Siemens, who's very much in the deployment nature. I'm going to talk a little bit about emerging technologies. So first of all, when we look at energy, in general, we've got power generation, we've got power transmission, including transportation and power use. Underlying that, of course, is a variety of technologies, but the foundation of that is really the emerging technologies. In our case, I'll talk about superconductivity, but certainly here in the Space Coast, we have a lot of emerging technologies, and it's those emerging technologies which really provide long-term economic development, <clears throat> which is what this consortium and this uh, region should be focused on. Uh, one good example is, is semiconductors and being able to leverage those assets. So you're able to take a technology, leverage it across many, many markets. Uh, you're able to build a foundation of entrepreneurs. You're able to attract venture capitalists to foster new innovation, hopefully maintain manufacturing, and try to address very high demand and rapidly growing markets. And hopefully, using something such as superconductivity, we can build the next Silicon Valley here on the Space Coast. So one good example, of course, is silicon the semiconductor. Some of you are old enough to remember vacuum tubes. What did silicon do? What did the transistor to do? Today, that iPhone is much more powerful than the computer. <coughs> excuse me, the computer you see on the left. <coughs> excuse me. So let me talk a little bit about superconductivity. Superconductivity is a phenomenon uh, which allows the flow of electrical current with absolutely zero resistance, zero losses, 
as long as you keep it cold. So what is the value proposition for superconductivity? Well, the value, depending on the application, is smaller, lighter, quieter, more efficient, more reliable, scalable, and enabling, such as an MRI system. Also, as Dr. Martin pointed out, rare earth materials are a big problem. Superconductivity replaces rare earth materials in things such as large motors and generators, and it's environmentally benign. So many, hang on one second, <clears throat> sorry. So many believe it could be the next revolution uh, in energy, and research and markets came out with this report in July of last year that says that major improvements in technology and applications are expected to bring a renaissance of superconductivity, sorry, <clears throat> in the next 10 to 15 years. Due to this, rapid growth and changes in technology, the superconductivity industry landscape will undergo a profound change bringing huge increases in demand and profits and billions of dollars and a competitive upheaval. So the landscape is large from power transmission, I'm sorry, power generation to transmission to use and I want to touch on a little bit about our company, <coughs> sorry, and how we hope to affect that. We were founded in 1995. We are experts in areas of high power magnetic systems, superconducting applications, and manufacturing automation. Uh, we have very extensive IP and electrical portfolio encompassing design, software, breakthrough magnet technology, and manufacturing processes. Our strategy then is to apply this technology into these large markets through a combination of manufacturing, joint ventures, licensing, and company spin-offs. The markets that we've been active in include energy, medical, aeronautics, space, defense, and research. I'm going to focus on, <clears throat> on uh, offshore wind for a minute, as Frank talked about. Uh, sorry. The DOE uh, came out with a plan about a year ago, which focuses on addressing off our energy with offshore wind, having 10 gigawatts by 2020 and 54 gigawatts by 2030. If you look at it globally, uh, the plan is in the next 10 years to have 164,000 megawatts of energy produced by offshore wind turbines. In order to do that, you would actually need 16,000 10 megawatt wind turbines. Those wind turbines <coughs> do not exist today. So one of the projects that we are focused on is to develop a 10 megawatt wind turbine with this value proposition, and I won't go through the details, but basically it's to have a much smaller and lighter generator that does not use rare earth materials, which will enable these 10 to 15 megawatt wind turbines. <coughs> so Frank talked a little bit about offshore, and Dr. Martin talked about uh, you know, funding these types of applications. If you look at where, in order for the DOE to achieve these goals of, of energy, which of course includes a certain cost of energy, today at 27 cents per kilowatt hour, hoping to be at 10 cents by 2020, and ultimately by 2030 at 7 cents per kilowatt hour offshore, a lot of things need to happen. And one of the things that they've identified, of course, is that you need next generation drivetrains, which is the generators, and even with that, they've identified that, that they need to be involved in superconductivity. Go ahead. So part of that plan is then to fund that. We are very fortunate. Advanced Magnet Lab is one of a handful of companies chosen in the United States to get initial funding from the Department of Energy to address those. We've assembled a world-class team, which includes turbine development companies, global manufacturers, national laboratories, as well as leaders in cryocooling, which is required for the cryogenics for superconductivity. And our core expertise is in the magnet technology. So leveraging superconductivity on the Space Coast, uh, we believe that emerging technology like superconductivity can significantly reduce the cost of energy production, increase energy efficiency, and it's environmentally benign. Uh, we believe these products will enable numerous products, I'm sorry, superconductivity products will enable numerous products and applications which address high demand, high profit, rapidly growing in multi-billion dollar markets. So I talked about power generation. Other things that we're working on is to significantly increase the power use things such as data centers and solar farms. Data centers today consume 3% of the U.S. electricity. We're working on very high power density motors, which can apply to a lot of applications, not just power generation, but power use. We're working on next generation commercial airplanes, we're working with NASA and the Air Force and Boeing to have very, very high power to low weight propulsion systems, which affect obviously aeronautics and also ships. And finally, showing the synergistic application of superconductivity here in the Space Coast, we are working with NASA in a couple different areas, including using superconducting magnets for uh, radiation 
space shielding, as well as energy storage, which will be an enabler for lunar space travel in the future. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Sorry. Our uh, next presentation is from Trevor Kennedy, the uh, Center for Advanced Innovation, with Chile as the modifier at the end there. Hey, thank you, Jim. Um, so I noticed in the materials that, and my name tag, Chile is spelled like the restaurant, not like the country. I think we have something to learn here. Um, so, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to the Space Coast. Um, our, our company, actually, we were invited uh, a couple of years ago to, uh, at, uh, by Senator Nelson to meet with the President in his visit to NASA in April of 2010. And um, I, I explained at that time that we had interest in potentially locating here and, and were uh, encouraged to do so. And, um, uh, we're in the process of doing that. We're moving into the Space Life Science Lab at Kennedy Space Center, and we're very glad to be doing so. Um, the, uh, uh, so I, I serve as the CEO of Molecular Power Systems, um, and our president, Rob Kahneman, is here with me today. Uh, we, we've been doing um, energy research in Tucson, Arizona for the last several years, and, uh, uh, but now we're moving all of our operations to the Space Coast. So we're quite excited about this. And um, um, I, I'm not new to Florida. I came to Florida in 1998 to work on a strategy for a software company down in Fort Lauderdale uh, called Citrix Systems. And at that time, we were 60 employees. Five years later, we were um, about 4,000 employees and had the highest EBITDA percentage of any company listed on NASDAQ. So if I have any skill at all, it's uh, doing well in Florida. So um, uh, happy to be here. Um, I, I think that we can grow dramatically, not we, just our company, but I think as a community we can grow dramatically. And one of the ways to do that in, in a global world is not just to look at globalization as a market activity, but really do it as an organic way that we go about our business. Um, one of our friends down in uh, Santiago de Chile has developed a new plasma technology I'm going to talk with you about. And, and I would say that this arrow is actually going the wrong way. I would say that actually in, in the first instance, the arrow goes from Chile to Florida uh, because we're going to be licensing technology from Chile to Florida. And then we're going to be providing, um, then we're going to be providing uh, that technology uh, that we're working on here, and we're going to do joint research down there. So, um, is it just the middle button? Okay. I haven't used up my time yet, right? I got two more minutes. Um, so, 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 Chile is a country that has significant water issues. There are places in Chile that have no human being remembers ever seeing rainfall uh, because you've got the Pacific on one side and the clouds come up the mountain and they rain. And, and they don't get over to the other side, and they come up from the Amazon, they do the same thing. Yet there's a lot of natural resources in Chile, the longest country in the world, and, uh, uh, and there's a lot of mining going on. And mining, as we know, we need many of those mined products from copper to rare earth and so on, but mining can be environmentally hazardous. Uh, we, we see this in the United States, abandoned mines out in the West and so on. So. One of the things that uh, Alfredo started working on was uh, new, new ways to clean water. And he came up with a very low energy plasma generator. Uh, and so the, this first plasma generator, uh, he's, he's always been very concerned about uh, the poor people who live in these little campamentos uh, all around Chile. Uh, these are dirt floor, little, you know, eight by 10 homes with, uh, entire families living inside them on nearly nothing. And ironically, they pay more for water to drink than we do. We might pay, I don't know, a, a buck for, well, maybe not the pint-sized one, but the next size up. They pay more than we do for water. And so he decided, well, let's do a small one while we're working on scaling up to industrial size 
and they implemented this little plasma generator in in this Campamento. This is uh, this is uh, Rosita, who's kind of the local uh, activist in their community. And, and in fact, we need activists. I think probably most of the people in this room are activists for the Space Coast. And if you can put activists to working on things that are good, good things happen. This thing runs on 100 watts. It costs about $200, and it sanitizes 2,000 liters of water for drinking every day very significant. When they announced this with a little PR release in, in Chile, uh, suddenly the Clinton Foundation, the Gates Foundation, and the CEO of Coca-Cola started calling. So the, pow the market power of things that do good can also help things do well. What we're interested in doing is bringing together a number of, of players here in Florida and on the Space Coast to work on joint research and the joint commercialization of technologies like this. Chile is a small country with some very talented engineers, but they have very little market. They don't know how to do the tech transfer. And they, they uh, built a model uh, in which you develop technology there, bring it to the US market, and from the US bring it to the rest of the world. So that's what we're working on. And the Advanced Innovation Center Chile is, um, is uh, currently located uh, down there, but what we're doing is uh, giving them office space at Kennedy Space Center so that we'll have an advanced in innovation center dash KSC. And, and the idea here is to, to work on joint development. So the CTO of NASA has been briefed and is into this. Um, I used to be on the, on the board of the American Electronics Association. It's now Tech America. Tech America is, represents 16,000 technology companies across the world. They're now into this, and I would recommend that as we get going and as we get established, that you join in with us. Um, some of the leaders, thanks to Mark and uh, some of the other people uh, here in the room, um, are, are very involved. I understand it's very difficult to get a badge for Nikolai, who's one of our Russian scientists, to come on to KSC. Um, apparently, we brought this up in a meeting with NASA the other day, and we're laughed out of the room. But our point of view is, in a global economy, we need to bring the best minds together. We built the new frontier at Kennedy Space Center. This is a new frontier, and we need to rally, and we need to bring the community together. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Michael Schiffer from Enterprise Florida. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here today with you. Um, we don't have my slides, so I'm going to have to wing this with you. Um, I did want to start out right off the bat and just ask everybody uh, to tell me whether your companies are doing business internationally. Would you raise your hands? So we have quite a few companies that are exporting overseas or doing business overseas. Uh, let me start by by introducing myself again, Mike Shavarth, Enterprise Florida. I wanted to. Uh, let you know that we are no way affiliated with Enterprise Rent-A-Car, so there's no way we can get you any good deals on a on a weekend rental. So I, you know, we got that out right out in front. Um, Enterprise Florida is the state's economic development organization, and we're charged uh, with uh, with assisting uh, uh, our local companies uh, to expand them here locally, and and also to attract companies from around the, the world to Florida. And, and the uh, bottom line is that we want to try to create jobs here, high-value added jobs within the state of Florida. So that's our mission. We're the economic development arm of the state. Um, initially, I represent the International Trade and Development Unit, uh, which is their international group. And what we do is primarily work with companies throughout the state to export their products and services abroad. Um, and we do that by a number of different programs and services. Um, we have six regional offices spread out throughout the state of Florida, and these regional offices have a trade advisor. That trade advisor works with area companies to help those companies to do business abroad. Um, we do export counseling, and this is really an important facet of what we do because typically what we want you to do is make your mistakes on paper, not with your hard-earned funding. So if we can get to you before you make a mistake overseas, if we can help you to grow your business successfully, using our trade advisors, I mean, it really does up the, uh, 
the uh, the potential for success for not only your company but also for the state uh, and seeing your company grow. We also do a number of educational seminars. Uh, the seminars range from how to do business internationally to uh, which countries, uh, what we call the doing business in uh, seminars, which doing business in Russia, doing business in China seminars, where we bring in uh, guest speakers and we go through the the, the market statistics, the uh, pros and cons of doing business in those markets. Um, we also provide a good deal of information statistics. So if you've not been to our website, eFlorida.com, I would highly recommend it. We have a vast amount of intelligence, market intelligence, research, statistics to help you kind of guide your company in international waters. Um, we also do what we call governor-led Team Florida trade missions. That's where the governor implements a trade mission with our team to various select market opportunity countries that we've designated. We've done uh, just recently a, a mission to Brazil uh, and to also to South Africa with the Lieutenant Governor. Those are very uh, targeted rifle shot approaches to markets where we go in and help companies to make pre-qualified matches with, with uh, companies uh, that they would like to do business with in those countries. Uh, so that's our, our Team Florida missions. We typically do about two of those per year. Um, we also do baseline missions, which are, are, are really kind of a, a small 15, 20 person group that goes into other uh, countries similar to our Team Florida governor-led missions. So they're a very effective way uh, to, to drum up business in these markets. I mean, I've had clients before say, I never know you existed. You didn't, I never knew you could do this. And I said, well, how did you generate business in Brazil? And he said, well, I'd just get on a plane, I'd get, it, get off the plane, I'd get the yellow pages out, and I'd start cold calling companies. Well, you don't have to do that. Um, what we do is we actually do that process for you. So, in other words, by the time you, you hit the ground in Sao Paulo, we've already got a lineup of potential business partners that want to meet with you that are exactly the kind of business partners you're looking for. So it's a very effective way to, to get your business overseas. We also do trade shows. Uh, these are industry-specific trade shows. Um, we do Florida pavilions, and what we do is we get companies over there that normally couldn't get there on their own. Um, and what we do is we provide uh, shared services. So, in other words, you know, the companies have many levels of participation in these shows. Um, they have their turnkey booths. We have uh, uh, private meeting rooms, usually there, Wi-Fi services, everything that they need to be able to actually be successful. Um, I just came back from Dubai, where we did the Arab Health Show. I specialize in the medical products area. And we had 15 exhibitors, Florida medical manufacturers. And uh, during that four-day long show in the Middle East, uh, we did $2.5 million worth of contracts at the show. And we have another $77 million in expected sales within the next 12 to 24 months. So these shows can be very, very effective because they're very different than the domestic shows. I mean, when we go to shows domestically, we're not always going there to actually generate business, but we're doing it for branding new product launches, a number of other reasons, but when you go overseas and you do these shows, 57% of the, the attendees are there to buy, to purchase products, so it's a much higher percentage internationally than it is domestically where it's about 32%. So think about these shows. We also offer trade grants. Trade grants can, uh, can be available to your company that pays 50% of your booth space up to $7,000. You can get one of these per year. So it's a very effective tool to help you to kind of underwrite some of your cost seed capital to get you into these markets, get you selling. Um, we also have uh, international offices. We have uh, seven international offices, and we have several pro bono offices. And these offices can be very effective. In other words, I've had a client before that was dealing with food seasoning products, and they were doing all the right things. They, were, they had their, market, their export marketing plan uh, in the process of being completed and uh, they had targeted Canada for food seasoning products as far as exports and uh, what I asked them is, is the question did you do a focus group study in that market before you launch your products in the food show in Toronto they said no we haven't but you know would like to do that so we got them in touch with our Toronto Canadian office and we did a uh, we brought four food brokers in and we had them just take a look at the products and give some recommendations what we found out was um, which was valuable information is that the the companies these food brokers said that they thought because this product wasn't branded in Canada that it would not really be a, in good placement within the shelves on the stores not only that they said that the color of the packaging just wasn't going to pop so I mean it, those are two bad strikes I mean one you're on the bottom shelves and then two nobody's going to really see you there so that was one of the issues that they came that they they raised with our uh, with our, our representative in Canada the second was they said you didn't have any 
labeling that was in French and English. That's a by law a requirement in Canada, so that, that would have to change. And then probably the biggest issue that nobody saw was that the Canadians don't like MSGs in their food seasoning products. So they had to take the food seasoning products, the, the MSGs out of the food seasoning, and then relaunch the product. So we got that information back to the company. They said, no problem. We do our own in-house labeling. We can put some more colors in it. We can do the French-English language. And we can take the MSG, MSGs out just for our international uh, products. So they went ahead and launched it in the Toronto Food Show. And that's how they became successful in that market. So these international offices that you have access to, um, in most cases, free of charge. I mean, because we didn't charge anything to do that food, uh, that that broker's uh, focus group meeting. Um, they're available to help you, and they're in key markets like Brazil and and uh, Spain and and Germany. So uh, I would certainly recommend you be a, you know take us up on, and take advantage of these these type of uh, offices that we have. There's uh, two new programs that we've just launched, um, which is one of them is a model for the country, which hopefully it'll be ramped out nationally um, after this year. It's called the Export Marketing Plan Service. It's where we've launched a partnership with the Small Business Development Centers, the Florida Small Business Development Centers, the U.S. Department of Commerce Commercial Service, and the SBA. And what this program does is it enables a company who doesn't really have a game plan overseas, doesn't have an export marketing plan, to have that marketing plan prepared for them by a business analyst within a one to two months uh, time frame. So what you would do as a company, if you didn't have a marketing plan, I thoroughly recommend that you do get an export marketing plan. Again, because I'd rather see you make your mistakes on paper than with your funding. But this export marketing plan becomes a successful road map for your company overseas. It identifies opportunities. It helps you to look at the right entry strategies and to look at the right promotional marketing opportunities to get you over there inexpensively. The export marketing plan works like this. You would probably most likely in, in, this, in this county, Brevard County if you're located here, would apply to the SBC in, um, in Orlando. That's the um, UCF SBC in Orlando at the National Entrepreneur Center. What you would do is make application online. Uh, once you're approved for the program, you pay $500. That's it. Um, from there, they, they sign a business analyst who then works with you to develop this customized marketing plan to your company. It's not an off-the-shelf plan. This is custom to your company. Um, what they do is they work on this for one to two months with you, and then within that time period, when it finishes, when they complete, and you sign off and you love it, it's great, just what you wanted, then the SBA funds them with $2,500 to pay for the plan. So the total cost of the plan is about $3,000. Your cost is about $500, but the SBA is picking up the, the balance of the, of the cost. Once you graduate and you have that marketing plan, you also can qualify for what they call a, uh, a gold key grant. That's $1,500 to help you participate in a trade mission abroad with Enterprise Florida or to do a gold key through the U.S. Commercial Service. How many of you know what a gold key is? Anybody? I'm telling you, you should really get to know what these are. This is, they're offered through the U.S. Embassy, through the Commercial Service. Uh, they're a specific matchmaking service that's, that's specific to your company. So as an example, if you were looking to target clean energy uh, technology, clean energy product uh, opportunities in, let's say, uh, Tanzania, and you wanted to get in front of some potential uh, government leaders that were maybe in charge of a Tanzanian cleaning, uh, clean technology project uh, for that country, they would actually go out, meet with these uh, officials, pre-qualify that uh, they're, you know, they're exactly the kind of company that would be a match for you, and, and that they're interested in meeting with you. And then they set, set you down in front of these meetings, with six to eight of these in, within a day's period, and, and interpreters included. So this is a fantastic way to go out and not fly to a country, pull out the yellow pages and start cold calling, but to actually get out there in front of some pre-qualified dealers, buyers, officials in the government that maybe call the shots for clean technology development projects in their country and try to get them aware of what you do and how you might be able to provide a service to them. So a gold key is a very effective tool that I would highly recommend you consider. And uh, we also, last but not least, have the World Bank PSLO program. Uh, this is a, one of, we're one of the only 10 states in the country that's going to be part of this World Bank initiative. And I don't know if many of you have got a chance to look at some of these developmental projects, but I just, you know, just yesterday, I think before I got over here, uh, did a quick lookup in the database and found that there's over a hundred and some clean technology development projects worldwide that's, that's, under, that's, uh, that's currently on the grid at this point. So what that means is that with these countries like Tanzania, um, New Guinea, um, 
Thailand, each one of these countries are, are looking at clean technology projects in which they're going after World Bank funding to underwrite these projects and you can actually bid on those projects as a sub and as a primary. Now I would say that most of these projects when they're getting into the billion dollar level are going to have larger primes that are going to be in there but they're responsible to have a lot of small to medium sized primes to bid in this process and they certainly do like to look for US content and US involvement in those projects because the US is a major contributor to the World Bank findings, financing. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about World Bank PSL programs and these developmental projects, some are at the $2 million level, some go up to the $1 billion level. There's hundreds of them out there. Um, I brought a sample of some of the, uh, some of the current uh, uh, projects that are right now on the grid. Uh, please let us know. We have a PSL officer uh, in Tampa. Her name's Lori Belovich. Uh, she's trained. She's a trained PSL officer with World Bank, and she's available to consult with you at any given time to see what you can do with that with those opportunities. So two things, two, two new initiatives that I think you should really consider that will help you to get look at these opportunities and, and tap these opportunities overseas. Um, I'll be available afterward. Um, if you want to learn more about this information, go to eFlorida.com. I have some handouts on both the Export Marketing Plan Service as well as the World Bank PSLO program, so I'll be more than happy to distribute that to you afterwards. I certainly thank you for the opportunity and wish you all the best. Um, our next presentation uh, will be from uh, uh, Buck Martinez of FPL and NextEra Energy. Thank you, Jim, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. I don't have PowerPoints. I really want to just speak to the team. Uh, basically, the message is Florida is poised to be a national and international leader in clean energy. But why hasn't that happened? Well, over the last three years and over, the, and over the next coming years, FPL will be investing and has been investing a tremendous amount of capital in Florida. Uh, during this period, we're probably going to be investing about $9 billion. That includes two modernization projects, one right here in Cape Canaveral, which is basically taking existing technology, vintage 1960s power plants, and we're basically converting them to new combined cycle, very clean energy. Thank you to Frank for that technology, but basically what it is is um, we're basically taking about $1.2 billion and in investing into this new technology, which basically creates now new combined cycle uh, natural gas, which is about 88% cleaner on, that, on particulate emissions, and also saves about 33% in fuel savings. So in essence, you take the existing infrastructure at these sites, you basically leverage your transmission, your land, your water, you put in the new technology, and over the life of the project it'll save our customers over $400 million in, in predominantly in fuel savings. So we're doing that in Cape Canaveral, that'll put about 650 people to work during its apex. We're also going to be doing that at Riviera. The Cape Canaveral project comes online 2013 and Riviera comes online in 2014. Now we have just announced that we're going to basically be doing the same thing at Port Everglades. A little more challenging, Port Everglades has four stacks. So what you see is these, these stacks that are approximately 350 feet high are not going to be about 150 foot high. And most people like that, the fishermen don't like that. So you can't, you can't win in these environments. But uh, right now we're in front of the Public Service Commission asking for a need determination. So hopefully uh, if we get that we'll be able to start the demolition at Port Everglades in 2013. The plant will come online in 2016. So basically these are $3.6 billion of investments. As we're doing this, we're also uh, what we call upgrading our nuclear plants. So basically at the existing nuclear plants, we're getting about 250 more megawatts. Uh, significant capital puts thousands of people to work. And uh, it's, a, it's a great story for the state of Florida. However, what's the missing ingredient? Well, what I haven't talked about is renewable energy, right? So Florida, Power and Light, which is the largest utility in the state of Florida where I work, we, we service about 4.6 million customers. And what's interesting about that is most people don't realize there's 55 utilities in the state of Florida. So FPL is the largest. We're about a market cap between us and our parent company, about $25 billion. But we're also the lowest cost, meaning the cheapest form of electricity in the state of Florida by far. So not only the largest, but, but cheapest, also have the highest operating, operational reliability in the state. What's interesting, though, is obviously we're very proud of that. 
But what people don't realize, we're also the largest renewable energy company in the nation. So it's okay, you know, when people say you can't be both green and you can't be, you know, lowest cost, we, we've proven we can't. So the issue is why can't we do more renewable energy in the state of Florida? Well, for three years, maybe four years now, Jim, right, the, we have been, uh, as a state, just continually just uh, unable to convince our regulators and legislators that renewable energy makes a lot of sense for the state of Florida. And let me tell you why it does make sense. So for FPL, we are very proud of our record. We're very proud of the fact that we're lowest cost utility in the state. However, Jim's point earlier was we are an, we are an importer, basically, of fossil fuel, right? We are going to be, after our modernization project, we're going to be about 77% natural gas as a utility, which is a great thing in the sense that it's clean, it's, it's reliable, it's very low cost. However, the problem is that all of that fossil fuel is coming from the Gulf of Mexico, meaning one curtailment, a hurricane, a terrorist activity, what have you, and we don't really have much diversification, right? So the issue is because of the fact that we're a peninsula, we don't have a lot of options. And we are also the largest uh, consumer but also the largest purchaser of natural gas. We spent about $4 billion purchasing natural gas, which, you know, it's, again, it's, it's a very reliable form of technology, but we need to figure out a way to diversify our fuel mix. So we've been pushing very aggressively, um, you know, over, the, over some time now to try to diversify the fuel mix in Florida. We don't have a lot of options. So what are those options? Well, I think biomass is an option. I think there's a, there's a number of folks that are very bullish on biomass here in the state of Florida. We've been, uh, we've been disappointed. Uh, We've been doing a lot of assessments on wind. There just doesn't seem to be a lot of pockets of wind, to, you know, opportunities here in the state of Florida, unless you go to the coast and unless you go offshore. And the problem with being on the coast, as we learned very painfully, we tried to we tried to permit six turbines in St. Lucie County on our property at our nuclear plant, and we couldn't even get this. We couldn't even get the county to give us a uh, a height ordinance to get the turbines on. So we for three years we tried. Uh, pushing that uh, in St. Lucie County, and we couldn't even get a hearing to get wind turbines. So imagine trying to do on that on the coastline. So I think the challenge will be eventually doing it offshore. And uh, I think on the, on the west coast of Florida, you have fairly you know, shallow waters, and you might be able to do some, some neat things. But it's, it's not here and now. I mean, I think it's going to be a very significant battle with the environmental community to try to get. It's not so much the turbines. I think the turbines are, you know, everybody recognizes they're going to work. And the turbines are going to be very cost effective down in the long term, but how do you get the power to shore without having the environmental community just uh, butt heads with you uh, through the whole process? So that's, that's going to be a challenge. So solar becomes what I consider to be the natural play. And we, uh, in 2008, Governor Christ had basically uh, put out a vision for, for renewable energy. He, I think he had a pretty aggressive vision. Back in 08, there was an uh, executive order that allowed for 110 megawatts. We quickly uh, went out and uh, put in for three projects, one of them here with NASA as a, as a public-private partnership, which was really a neat project. We, we built 10 megawatts that go to the grid, put a lot of folks to work, and then in lieu of cash for leasing the, uh, the land at NASA, we, we built them a one megawatt facility, in essence what they call behind, behind their fence. So we built the SOTA, which was 25 megawatts. At that time, it was the largest solar project in the nation. That's photovoltaic. And that put a lot of people to work. We had folks from Italy, China, Portugal, Spain, everybody visiting DeSoto. I think people were saying, you know, Florida is going to be the mecca for, for solar energy. Uh, we then launched the first uh, hybrid of its kind, which was a solar project, 75 megawatt concentrated solar project, in essence connected to our natural gas facility at Martin, the first of its kind. So in essence, it wasn't, incre it wasn't an incremental 75 megawatts. It was, in essence, to displace fuel when the sun's out. It displaces natural gas. So we've been in the solar business for over 20 years. We've got the largest solar project in the, uh, in the country from way back when out in the Mojave Desert. We're building solar in Spain. Uh, we're also do we're in 28 states, right? We're, uh, we're the largest wind producer in the United States. So right here in our backyard, <laughs> where we're the largest renewable energy company, we cannot get any traction. So, uh, and it doesn't look like anything's going to happen this year, Jim. So, uh, 
basically what's ha when when I say Florida is poised to be a natural leader, a natural leader, and an international leader, we are. We've got some of the best deep sea ports. We've got incredible universities. We've got a tremendous amount of research in this state. We've got some of the largest companies that are in this business, like Siemens, GE, ourselves, that are very eager and bullish to go forward. But we, we just cannot get any traction. So it's going to require folks like yourselves to be able to champion these causes. And part of the issue that we have in Florida is that we've had, we've had such a low-cost uh, utility bill that basically what happens is there's a, there's a fear that renewable energy will create a sticker shock effect. But what's happening in the industry, the solar costs are coming down so rapidly. And right now we're able to build, we, we would be able to build a 100 megawatt facility at about one third the cost of what we built at Soto. And that's, that's phenomenal. It's going to be, you know, there's not going to be such a, you know, people talk about grid parity and grid parity this and that, but you know, solar is not a silver bullet. So, so, you know, solar will be a niche play. And the reason for that is until you can solve the storage equation and make storage, you know, at what I would call uh, cost effective, because right now it's about $1,000 a kilowatt, which is significant. So solar will have a play, and especially in Florida, where in essence your peak power is your summer, so it, it plays naturally, you know, very um, naturally with our, with our kind of uh, grid. The other thing we're doing is we've, we're, uh, we're investing significant money in a uh, smart grid program. We've already, we've already deployed over 2.5 million smart meters. We're intending to do all 4.6 million smart meters by 2014. We're also working on getting platforms in for new innovative uh, smart grid applications. One of them being if, if we're able to get legislation at some point in time, we would like to build the Babcock Ranch facility, which is a, it's in essence a, a futuristic city. It's going to have smart grid. It's also going to have smart transportation, which you know I call it the Jetsons kind of project. Which it's a, a transportation system basically where it's a self-driving mechanism, require people to drive. So all that's being built into the city, and the developer Sid Kitson, who owns all this property out there, has already been working very aggressively. He's got all the permits. The project is debt-free, and it's going to be. Uh, a city that already has uh, a lot of traction. It'll have about 17,000 residences, about 6 million square feet of commercial space. And the intent is to attract companies like Siemens, like FPL, and others to, for, to, to be in that facility as, in essence, a living lab. Uh, and then speaking of living labs, we at FPL have deployed a number of technologies on our campus, and we're measuring that grid. So we've got smart grid meters, I mean smart meters, we've got uh, six different solar applications and then we partner with Scripps which is also um, uh, people don't realize but Scripps is not just a biomedical research they're an energy research company and they're working hard and aggressively on opportunities for storage going forward so there's a lot going on but we're not capturing what we really need to capture is how can Florida become the exporter and the national leader in, en in clean energy so well, how do you leverage these deep sea ports? When you're paying 30 some odd cents a kilowatt hour in Central America and South, South America, and we're paying 11 cents here, and solar's coming down to anywhere 15 cents to 16 cents, why shouldn't we be able to be the vertically integrated hub of clean energy here? We've had so many companies write our legislators and our governor basically saying, write policies, they would move their manufacturing right here into the state of Florida. We had companies that were ready to build. They were going to have a research and development uh, facility, a solar research but right here at NASA. We've had companies that have been uh, very aggressive and looking to bring Semitech, which is a semiconductor uh, entity here that created $18 million of capital, $18 billion of capital in, in Texas. They were looking to uh, come here to Florida and bottom line is that that's still, you know, it's kind of stagnant. So while we are poised, the opportunity is quickly going away, and and I would venture to say that if, if we don't leverage this opportunity the next year or two, it's gone forever. Because when you invest 250 million dollars in a manufacturing plant, you're not going to pick it up and move it the next day. So companies like SunTech, which are some of the large Chinese companies, they they built the manufacturing plant in Arizona. First Solar built it in Ohio. SunPower is built in one in Texas. They've got some in California. So. The industry is moving quickly, but they're they're not they're not migrating towards Florida. So, unfortunately, that's that's the reality. Uh, we will continue to to do the best we can to to try to get this industry moving. But 
it's going to be a tough push. Jim? I, I've been I've been com, uh, uh, given permission to run us till 10:45, so we've still got 10 more minutes. And I, I want to summarize a little bit, then I get right to questions. Um, you heard here, albeit mostly from an industrial sort of perspective or a slightly government uh, perspective, say the Enterprise Florida, in helping industries go out and do these things. You'll see that all these people up here were talking about the word investment. Okay, and we're talking about a future. It's a bright future. There's lots of opportunities in the energy kind of uh, future out there. Uh, the market growth that Frank talked about um, from the utility perspective and so forth. I want to throw out three more numbers at you to get outside the picture frame, kind of speaking, that our very first speaker spoke to you. Um, Buck mentioned about 11 cents a kilowatt hour, 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That's what we're paying here in the state of Florida. How much are we paying for gasoline, guys? Yeah, I don't know, 350. Okay. Do you know that that electricity that you're buying today is the equivalent of 99 cents a gallon gasoline? If you switch to an electric car, you're paying 99 cents a gallon. Okay. That's effectively that's what you're doing. So we need to manufacture the equipment, the turbines, the windmills, the solar panels here in Florida, keep all the money here, and we need to get off of gasoline because it doesn't come from Florida. Okay? And so as a result, there's an electric future out there revolving around our transportation system that is a huge market. And that's true to all the worlds that we're going to export out. So I think we've got opportunities in here. we just got to realize those. With that, I'd like to open up the questions to the audience, uh, and then got to believe you've got some. Yeah, right, go ahead. I think maybe the Enterprise Florida it seems to be finally a uh, focus on trying to increase our manufacturing here in the country. There are two hundred left in the state budget for incentivizing manufacturing to return back, back overseas and helping shortening manufacturers. You know, going here. Michael, can you repeat the question a little bit? Just so get on the webinar. We're very aggressive with assisting manufacturing, and when, when you look at the international trade and, and uh, development programs that we have, they're primarily focused on manufacturing. Um, when we do a lot of these industry trade shows, it's the manufacturers, the Florida manufacturers that are participating in those, and they're the ones that are reaping the benefits and growing. And over the last several years, you've had a lot of firms that were not internationally diverse in their sales structure, and they struggled. I mean, they had flat growth. Uh, in some of these cases, they uh, laid people off, they even closed doors. But a lot of these firms that we've worked with over the years that have been generating international business actually grew. They expanded their operations. Uh, they continue to add employees. And so I think the key is in a, in a globally competitive marketplace, especially when you look at 10% of the populations outside the United States, I mean, we have to begin being very competitive, not just selling abroad. We need to be smart when we sell abroad. That's why I think we're very pleased with this export marketing plan service because I can't tell you how many times I've sat in front of companies and asked them, you know, where are you selling? Where would you like to sell? And I'll say, well, I think maybe Colombia. Colombia might be a great market. And I said, well, why Colombia? Well, because my wife's from Colombia. Now, that may be a great reason um, because she may have wonderful family connections in that country, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for the hard numbers that indicate market opportunities, market capture opportunities. So I think that uh, to answer your question, it's probably a, never been a better time to be a Florida manufacturer. I just want to add to that uh, uh, comment. Um, the state of Florida has got a unique opportunity that just happened this last year. We've always had an elected official in charge of agriculture, made in Florida. Okay? Today, that elected official now is in charge of energy. That has never been the case in the past. And that elected official, um, who is the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture and Community Services, Okay, wants to have energy made in Florida. We've never ever had that before where there was an elected official up there that wanted to get energy done in the state of Florida. So I think there is an opportunity to be upbeat about being made in Florida. Any other kind of comments or questions? I don't know if some of them addressed as to why that may be and what needs to occur to the energy policy in the state of Florida that allows this influx of, of uh, companies and what have you to make this uh, an uh, energy state as opposed to an energy policy state. 
I'll, I'll take a shot at it. I'm not sure. I, I know the. I don't think anybody has the answer, but I think we we've heard a plethora of, of excuses over the last few years, and I really believe that the the number one issue is the fear of cost escalation, meaning nobody in the legislature wants to be tagged with having tax uh, honored. So if it's an RPS, if it's a 2% mandate, whatever it may be, they view that as being held accountable then to passing a tax. And unfortunately, when you have very low electric prices, they I think there's been a comment made over the last few years whereby in session, they've said not one more penny, not one more penny. So Jim's point is if you look at it as a cost, yeah, you're always going to be looking at it as a tax or as a fee. If you look at it as an investment, it would be radically different, right? So what would it take to invest in a manufacturing, R&D, assembly, and development of renewable energy in the state of Florida? And how many of those people would be put to work? And if you look at it as an investment, how many people that would in essence be paying a penny more would be pay, pay, be paid two pennies less or three pennies less because they would be in essence reducing the unemployment tax that we have been burdened with in the state because as unemployment has been at certain levels in the state of Florida about 10 percent there's a huge unemployment tax that we're all paying and that would be reduced significantly by an investment in a manufacturing and or renewable energy sector and I remember I think it was tax watch that had done a study of of all this and they basically had some pretty good numbers as well as there have been a study done by the Washington Economics Group that said about 40,000 jobs would be created in the state with the passage of I think it was like 500 or 700 megawatts of renewable energy so I think we have to keep I think we have to look at it as an investment in the overall picture as opposed to saying well it costs more money because re renewable energy does a number of things one is it it's an economic development play I think we all realize that if if you truly had a vertically integrated uh, opportunity that meant that you would have biomass, wind, solar, whatever it may be, but you would have it from the ground up. So whether we capture the silicon market or not, I don't think we can be that aggressive. But we sure can capture the manufacturing sector. We can capture the R&D sector. We can capture the export sector because there's no reason why Florida should be the number one exporter of solar panels all over the world and maybe even wind turbines from all over the world, right? I mean, you know, Frank, Frank's company is, is an amazing entity. But, they, you know, if there, it was a, if there was a sustainable policy here in, the, in Florida where you, would, you know you would have off-takers that would be taking your wind manuf you know, turbines like FPL or your solar panels like FPL and others, then you know you have enough opportunity to have the off-taker here and then be aggressively promoting it outside of, the United, outside of Florida. So it... it, it I think we just have to change the economic perspective on this. And and I can see when solar costs were $6,000 a kilowatt, but we're down to approximately $2,000 a kilowatt. I mean, that's going to be, you know, you're going to be basically hunting with a, all fossil fuel at that, at that rate. Now, keep in mind, though, solar is not going to be, at, you know, capacity factors of 90% or 80%, whatever. It's going to be 18 to 20% because at nighttime it doesn't hunt and on cloudy days it doesn't hunt. But if you look at it as a kind of a niche play, a peak play, there's plenty of opportunity to build significant megawatts here in the state of Florida. I just wanted to add one quick comment. Um, you know, this panel here is also interested in the international opportunities. Clearly we have a market and an opportunity here in Florida. And I, I think the question I'd like to ask, and I don't know who's going to take this one out, is that, and Buck mentioned it, there are several places to the south of us in South America that pay a lot more for energy than we do. We learned about you know, the price of water in Chile for things. So there are some opportunities for us to realize that manufacturing them there, if we're concerned about our markets being, the price being too low and maybe not ready yet, we should be taking advantage of these international things. So I was hoping the panel might want to, throw out something as to maybe what we as a state can do or what we can do to encourage our companies to have markets from the international perspective. So, so our company, uh, Molecular Power Systems, part of our plan is to have a manufacturing plant here in Florida and to export clean energy solutions on a worldwide basis. We have a lot of interest in Asia. We have a lot of interest in Europe. Um, we are looking at acquisitions of technology and companies on an international basis to relocate them here um, and actually we're ignoring to a great extent the state and 
I don't want to take away from Enterprise Florida. I served on the board of Enterprise Florida for almost 10 years, and we did great things with uh, Citrix and Enterprise Florida because our manufacturing was writing code, and we would invest billions in writing code, and our manufacturing literally was clicking a button because we stopped doing disks and, and, and books, and it turned into just a digital stream and some PDFs. In the case of energy, we, we expect to be building systems here uh, potentially on the Space Coast, and um, we're currently you know, looking at that. And uh, we don't expect anything from the state because the state's in pretty bad financial shape. In, in the future, you know, maybe there's something coming from the state, but, um, but the relationships are very important. And the relationships with uh, potential vendors here, with potential end user customers here, and, and with um, partners uh, outside of, of the state and outside of the country are critically important to our, our pathway. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I interrupted you with my question. Go ahead. Well, it, it depends. So, like Florida Power and Light, we're in the top quartile. But you have, since you have 55 utility, I mean 55 utilities, each of them is going to compare, you know, at a different rate. At, at FPO, you're paying about ninety-five dollars for a thousand kilowatt hours, which the average is significantly better than the national average. But you might have some co-ops that are paying one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy dollars uh, for the same amount of usage. So. Part of the issue that I think Governor Scott, when his transition team came down here, was he was focused on trying to have the lowest cost electric rates to attract manufacturers here to the state of Florida. So the the issue is I'm not sure you can lump all those companies into one. You might you either have to do it on a regional basis or you do it by utility. But I I can tell you you know we're we're very proud of where we are at, but I can't speak for all the other utilities. New England. Yeah, when you compare against New England, you compare against California, you compare against a bunch of markets, it's not even close. The, the, the issue for us has always been those very heavy duty coal companies or coal entities like that combine it with nuclear, like Southern Company, had a very low cost, Alabama, Mississippi. But now those companies that have been long on coal are having some significant issues because the cost of putting in scrubbers and basically having to clean up that or the potential of a carbon tax could put them in significant jeopardy in the long term. So you see a lot of these companies scrambling to figure a way to try to get off the coal. Um, and if, if, if fracking or when fracking hits, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of pressure on the coal industry because that's, you know, gas prices are going to be, you know, basically, I, I, would, I would think gas prices would be fairly stable for many years. I, I've got a question, believe it or not, on our webinar. Isn't technology amazing? I think, Marsha Elder, are you on? I am. Hi. You ready? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this webinar participant asks, what is the best estimate of the time frame for when the political landscape can change in ways that will then match with the renewable energy investment potential mentioned today so that this potential for successful investment in renewable energy industry in Florida becomes a reality? I don't, I don't think there's a need to change the political landscape. I think what's, what happens is I think market forces will get us there. I, I really believe that um, what you're seeing the cost of renewable energy come down radically and significantly, and that's because technology is getting better, but they're also because of scale. Um, I think for, for us, for example, uh, our ability to build large-scale projects would be able – would allow you to get those costs lower. I don't believe, though, that you can ever compete, and I'll say ever, compete with an entity like a clean natural gas facility that is producing energy at, you know, 90 percent of the time compared to a solar project that only, you know, compares a, you know, produces energy at a certain percent of time. The key is going to be how do you develop an energy policy that is embracing of all the different technologies so you're not looking at 
one project, one off. Like for us, for, for us to be able to bring a project to the Public Service Commission, it's a one off project and, and it's always viewed as what's the lowest cost opportunity at that time. I think the, the, the regulatory landscape has to be where you allow companies to pre, 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 you know, bring a project forward that is looked at more than just on the lowest cost available. It's, it, it, it takes things such as economic development into play. It takes things such as diversification of fuel. It takes things such as energy security into play. And then it looks at it as a holistic approach as opposed to just one little element. If not, what you're going to have is an overabundance in one te technology, and you could be exposing yourself to volatility in the marketplace. <laughs>